um, with like the best details, and I'll say some candies on the line here. Um, with some best details you can, tell me, uh, like, once they started talking about the Garden of Eden, what was it like? What was their the details? Yeah. Whatever they wanted. must not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you will die. You must not eat. If you do, you will die. Okay, so this is the question that always gets me. If, um, if the consequence is so bad for eating fruit, if the consequence is so bad, why even make it an option, right? Um, so that, that's the kind of question that puzzles me a little bit, and so that's the kind of question I want to think about. So give me the next slide. Um, because the question for me is why, why even make it possible to sin? Why even make that an option? Why make death an option? And for me, the kind of answer is this gift of free will. God's incredible gift of free will. And I think I, you guys who, you've had me in mid-high before, you probably have heard me talk about it, but my favorite analogy that can show God's well, not that he just, also he didn't make us robots, but at the same time, there's this kind of idea of a story of a, going to a dance, right? You guys are at the dance, and you're like doing your sprinkler, your shopping cart, um, and then all of a sudden, you spot out of the corner of your eye, the person that you totally have a crush on has walked in the door, and you're like, oh my gosh, they're here, right? And you, like, you, you totally know that moment was the first time you see it, and you know that, oh, they're in the building. Okay. So here's the, here's the thing. You guys have two scenarios in this option. Uh, which one would you guys rather, would you rather prefer? One, that you get to the dance, and you see that person, and you can go up and ask them to dance, but they absolutely have to say yes. It's a rule, they don't have a choice, they have to say yes. Okay, that's option A. The second option is you go up to that person and you ask them to dance and they have a choice, but they actually say yes. Which one would you, um, they could have said no, but they wanted to say yes. Which one would you rather have happen in that scenario? Number, number two, number one, number two. Either way, they're saying yes. <laughs> I think, okay, I think if we're serious. Are there more of these? Yes. Uh, right up there. Um, if you are seriously thinking about that scenario, you would want the second option, right? You would want that person to want to say yes. And I think that's the same with God, right? He could have made us robots. He could have made us have to say yes, have to do what he wants, have to live the life that he created for us. But he wanted to give us the choice, right? And because something is lost if we lose free will, we, that sense of relationship, that sense of true, genuine love for one another is lost if we don't have this sense of choice. So that's kind of where we're, we're set up. And then it's this, this idea of, uh, so give me the next one. Um, and that, that's kind of what those two trees represent, if you guys think about it. 
there's these two trees, and the first tree is the tree of life, and it's the access to kind of eternal life, this full life that God has for us. And then the second one is this the this tree that represents the choice, right? The cho- the choice to know good and evil. To, and if you know evil, it probably means you've experienced it. And so um, we we can do that. So. That's what these two trees are about. And the minute that um, Adam and Eve choose this tree where they know good and evil, um, the, the consequence was that they are um, cut off. So I want us to read through, um, read through Genesis 3 and see what they really did with that choice. So look through. I want you guys to read through and then pay attention to the details again of what's going on. What kind of happened here? Somebody tell me. Okay. What what happened with what did they do with their choice? Well, it's clear um, the woman caused it, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> sure, you know. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Don't understand yeah, what it says. That is, that's true. Um, okay, Doesn't so... Doesn't that get me a candy? <laughs> we're going to move on. <laughs> we're gonna, we can go into that one later. Um, so, the serpent, right, has said, you must... What is what is Eve's response though? What is what does she say God said? Yeah. Um, uh, she said that the serpent Yeah. So her her response though, I think the wording that she uses when she talks about the rule God made and the rule that <coughs> God made in the first chapter are a little different. Can anyone spot the difference? Yeah. You can't even touch it. Right. So she kind of embellished it, she added to it, talked about um, why, like, sh- and for me, I'm like, why would she, why would she embellish it? Why would she change the rule? And I think there's a sense that, you know, God is really, sh- there's, there's a kind of an attitude going on where it's like, God is really strict. He doesn't want me to do anything um, fun. I can't have the thing that I want. And so she kind of, she's kind of twisting in her own mind what God's actual intention is for it. Okay, and so they, um, they eat the fruit and then... They receive the punishment. What's the punishment? What what actually happens once they kind of make their choice? Yeah. Um, then God, God made the serpent like crawl on his belly like he didn't have feet anymore. And then, um, I'm going to quote it. Uh, then he said to the woman, I will sharpen your pain of pregnancy and the pain you will give birth and the desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And then um, it says for the guy that he has to, like, grow the land, take care of the wife, and then, like, from the de- um, from you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Mm-hmm. So here, is, this is the moment. This is the moment where we see sin, suffering, and death kind of enter our world, and from that moment forth, we have lived in a world that that's the reality. Okay, give me the next slide here, and I want somebody to find me Romans 3.23. Yeah. Read it out loud. Awesome. So right, it is it is the first the creation story, but we are all actually a part of it. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Thank you. There we go. Heads up. <laughs> okay, and so uh, all of a sudden we are kind of uh, realizing that this sin is like a part of everyone, and I was just at the mid-high retreat, and he gave this awesome analogy, and so I don't pretend that I came up with this analogy, it was totally um, his really good idea, but I loved it, and so um, what I, what he did was he, he brought on this backpack, and he talked about this backpack is like those things that, um, where we try to, um, kind of carry those things in us that separate us from God because, right, the result of this fall, the result of their sin is that 
they're cast out of the garden, they're cast out of this like intimate relationship with God, all of a sudden they're ashamed when God <coughs> walks in and they're guilty. So we kind of lose this sense of re- intimate relationship with God and then there's separation of sin. And so what it is is things that we try to that kind of se- get in the way, they're kind of roadblocks, things that separate us from God and things that we try to put before God and kind of lose right relationship with him. So he, he has this backpack full of stuff that we can use in our life to kind of, that kind of separate us from God and that make us try, um, try to kind of feel that void in a different way. So the first one um, pulled out a Cosmo, right? A body image. This is like on the stands. It's the first thing I saw when I walk in the Bartels. We can use uh, body image and how we look to want to kind of make up for that um, that feeling that we aren't whole, and it can become something that gets in the way between our relationship with God, right? Um, he pulled out a beer can, alcohol, or other substances that can um, separate us from God. Uh, electronics, right? Uh, something that we, if we spend too much time on, it can, anything that can block um, our closeness with God. Even pulled out a, a school book, right, where school is not necessarily a bad thing, but if we spend, invest so much in it that we, our relationship with God is hindered, uh, it can really come, become something that really separates us. And it's kind of this image, like it's on this table, it's in between me and God. Um, let's see, athletics, something that we can put uh, between us and God, something that we can kind of make into an idol. Again, not that they're bad things, but we got to be careful. Um, this, for me, is my planner, too. This, uh, For me, this is a big one because I sometimes think that if I work hard enough, I can get what I want, and I don't have to trust God. And... Um, you know, if I just keep working and I just keep trying, it, it, I, I don't need God. It, it kind of keeps me away from God sometimes in that, that intimate trust relationship we need. And then this is a fun, um, Liz and Sarah in the picture, but it's a, a photo booth picture. And sometimes even our friends in our relationship can um, take that spot of where God should be. And so there, we have a sense that sin is really real and it separates us from God. And uh, give me the next slide here, Josh. God, uh, is his response to sin first is like righteous anger. Like when I told you that story about my dad, I, I was kind of telling you, like, I'm angry about it. I'm mad that that happened because it's also I'm really sad about it. Like, right, it's a, just a symptom of our brokenness. And so what God does is his response to our sin is righteous anger. So it's this dilemma, right? He is really... He really hates our sin, but he really loves us at the same time. And so he has to come up with a solution. So the solution is Jesus Christ. And what Jesus does is basically, right, he flips the table and opens up this um, this pathway to this right relationship with God. And so it's a, uh, that's, I mean, that's what Jesus does, right? He, uh. And I wrote it down because I wanted to say it just right. So Jesus came into our world. He endured the death that we deserve. He walked freely into it. He creates atonement for our sins. He takes the sin that we have on him and replaces it with his perfection. And ultimately, um, on the cross and the resurrection, defeats sin and death. So that when God sees us, he sees Jesus' perfection and not our own sin. Which is a pretty cool thing that that is the response. The full circle story is that in the beginning, there is this, we bring the sin and suffering into the world, and God's response is that He loves us enough to bring Jesus and His death into the world so that we can be um, free from that sin. It's pretty cool. All right, so give me the next one. And then um, I kind of wanted to talk about uh, suffering too, right? Because the, the sin and the suffering are all connected. It's all part of that, that what got brought into our broken world. 
And what, what really is suffering? It is kind of our pain, our hopelessness, our hardship, our aloneness. And, uh, you know, why does God let it happen? I think that's a question a lot of us have. That's a question I was asking um, when I heard about my dad. What, why is this happening? Why is God allowing it to happen? But I do want to point out that there might be a difference here between cause and allow, because um, I'm even thinking of, like, someone from the... Do you guys remember when there was that earthquake in Haiti? It was a little bit while back, but... Um, I was thinking about some of the people that died in that earthquake, right? Because some of the, the fault was that there was <coughs> some faulty buildings, right? These buildings weren't totally made up to code, so when the earthquake came, they couldn't stand up and people were killed kind of in the rubble. And some of that is from sin, or maybe there was some greedy contractor or something like that. And God didn't cause that, that suffering to happen, but he allowed it because he allowed that free choice and the, result, the resulting consequences um, in our world. So now that's part of just the world that we live in. Um, maybe the next one. Um, so, we have to kind of think about how we live in this broken world, and some of the questions that we ask are, why God, where are you God, and a lot of the scriptures, you guys, are revolved around this, like, if you think about all the Psalms, like, Jesus on the cross quoted a Psalm when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is, Jesus is wrestling with these questions, and... Uh, if you read, like, the book of Job, Job is, you know, he's just lost everything. And then he kind of goes to God and says, why God? And God's only answer is, I'm God. And it wasn't very settling, but this whole, the whole sense that we can wrestle with it, and that's okay. Um, give me the next one, though. But the cool part is that um, we also live, although we live in a broken world, we also live as people of hope. Partly because we have a community of faith. We, we don't have to do it alone. Um, secondly, because can God use our suffering? In some way, um, God brings light into really dark situations, right? So with my parents, that was really hard. But the way that God used it to grow me and um, the, the kind of the person that I am now because I went through that is part of the reason why I'm here today, like why my faith is so strong. And so God does this miracle of bringing light into these really dark situations, so it gives us some hope. And finally, um, the resurrection of Jesus. Our eternity is secure. Death does not have the last word. Heaven is a place with no sin, no brokenness, no pain, and no tears, which is a beautiful thing. So those are kind of just an introduction to how we kind of think about these questions of sin and suffering, and I wanted to oh, invite them up. <laughs> I just the thanks for the office was open. Okay, <laughs> sure, totally. Um, so, I told you guys earlier that um, Jeff and Becky are here, and so I want to invite them up. They're graciously um, coming to talk through questions with us, because uh, the, the decision that you guys are making with confirmation is such a cool um, decision to kind of own your faith, and so I wanted to talk through some of these big questions. So think about some of the questions you have written down on your piece of paper, and also if you want to write a question down, um, and then I'll just run, I'll just come around, and you can like if you have multiple things written on your paper, you can circle the one you want me to ask. But come around and. Throw it in the bucket, and then I, you can kind of anonymously ask the questions that you really want to know. So, does anybody want to throw? You're, you're okay to just raise your hand and ask too. But so, Jeff and Becky, we are talking about the turn and suffering in our coming, but also we've just been in this process of confirmation. So, big questions are coming up for students, and we wanted to talk through them. Of course. Um, and you're recording. Oh, there you go. Yes. Yeah. I just need to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Amber, okay. thanks for having us. Yes. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to open up the floor. I'll toss you a candy if you ask a really good question, but I'll also come around if you want to throw a question in the bucket. Anyone? Yes. Thank you.
So I'm thinking back to, I'm going to take a you know, look at the Bible part of this, and I go back to the very beginning, and it feels like, uh, you know, with Adam and Eve and the kind of the brokenness between the relationship with God and, and humans, what, what was came out of that was there was going to be this toil with the land and toil with each other, <clears throat> and then also physical death, you know, that was, that was part of, that's one way to explain kind of why all these things go, and that in Jesus, we're going to see a reversal of all those things, right? We're going to... Re- it's a reversal of how relationships work and, and even death itself. And so, from my theological point, I do believe that suffering is a, is a product, it's a byproduct of sin. That doesn't mean that I necessarily sinned and caused my arm to break or something like that. But just in the biggest, gigantic, theological, philosophical understanding of, of uh, suffering, I think that, that it comes out of that. Now, I think God can redeem everything. <clears throat> God makes good things out of bad things all the time. That's what we know. And so I think that God can even use suffering for, for good ends. Um, but I'm not sure I am not sure I would say that... Uh, I, I think that suffering is a, is a cause of kind of our broken world that we live in, and my, broken, my broken self. Anything to add? No, I would say that was true. And I think <laughs> thinking of that parable or the story of Jesus um, interacting with the man who... He's talking to his parents um, about a man, man born blind. And I, I just think it's really, we have to be really careful. It's really bad theology for us to connect our own suffering with our own sin. Like, I think when it gets to that place, and I can think of a lot of stories where people have been harmed by that kind of theology, where they are going through a really difficult thing in their life and someone, you know, tries to make it about something they did wrong. Because that's not true. That's not how God feels about us. That's not how Jesus feels about us. So, I agree. And there's consequences, right? If I, <coughs> my follow-up question is, how come I didn't feel this? Oh, that wasn't yeah. her. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was kind of delirious She's really good questions. at the mid-high retreat, so. Is there another one? Oh, other you questions? wanted candy. <laughs> <laughs> do, you think it, do you think Adam and Eve were set up, to, set up for failure? Meaning, I, mm. I kind of think of that original story, and you go, it's like that, you got SpongeBob and Patrick trying to guard <laughs> the big red button. And so, that's exactly right. And they can't touch the big red button, but you know you know it's inevitable that that's going to take place. And so, right. because you could have said the uh, knowledge of, of uh, good and evil, that could have been, say, worm ridden, yeah. rotten looking fruit. Right. And if they would have, <laughs> it's like the temptation was so great. And then right. you had the serpent thrown in there. Was there ever a chance for them not to fall? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Start? Sure. I, I mean, I think it's a really good question. I think, you know, they were exactly like we are in terms of we know that, like, we can know something and believe something, but then um, still make a different choice because I think, you know, this is where I think about total depravity. <coughs> we're, we, we're lent to go our own way and do our own thing. You know, what does that hymn say? We're prone to wander. Um, so... I don't know if I'd call it destined to fail or set up for failure um, because that speaks to me of intent of God, and I think God's intent is for us not to fail, for us to choose, but I think God wants us to have a choice. Is the implication of that, uh, those first few verses there, that um, getting knowledge, or is that awareness, uh, and why is it simple to Before we got here, so God told Adam that he would surely die from eating the fruit that would provide knowledge of good and evil. So is knowledge simple? Yeah, I think you know. I think the hard part about this passage for me is you know I think we want to I want to like screw it down and say tell me exactly what this means and do it. And the reality is it's it's a it's people looking back going oh, how do we get to where we're at like and what does God say about me right and so. All these different cultures everywhere have all these different sort of creation stories, like how they, how creation happened. What's different about our creation story, right, is that God created us good, 
and created us in his image. And then even when we screwed up, he decided he's going to make a way for us. That's just totally idiotic compared to all the other gods. All the other gods, like, you screwed up, you know, you're done. <laughs> and, uh, but our God created us good, created us in his image. So I'm not sure if, it, if it's really set up to ask those particular questions. This is just me reading. So I want to read it like it's meant to be read, which is, wow, these people wanted something. They wanted to be like God. Right? They wanted the knowledge of what being like God was like. It's like that Bruce Almighty movie. You know, they wanted to know. Bruce Almighty? Yeah. yeah. You know, they wanted to know what it's like to be God. And then all of a sudden they go, oh, this is not what I had shaken. And so, I mean, I think knowledge is not a bad thing. I think knowledge is a good thing. But I think the desiring to be like God is the thing that's the kicker. Yeah, because this, this, to that point, maybe there's this follow-up in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. It says, God God said, the man has become like one of us. And I was curious as to yeah. who he's referring to as us in that. Yeah. Where are you? Uh, chapter 3, verse 22. man has become like one of us. <clears throat> yeah, you already get this um, sort of imagery right at the very beginning of this sort of Trinitarian, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know, like God in community with himself at the very beginning. So that's how I kind of read it. I read it as, it's sort of a s putting forward to kind of how we understand God as God in three persons, God one God, three persons, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. <coughs> that's what I think when I think one of us. Yeah. These are some along the same lines. If God is all-knowing, then why did he allow the serpent into the garden? Wouldn't he have known? Or did he trust his creation to resist temptation? It's <coughs> a really good question. <clears throat> um, is it okay to say I don't know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I just don't. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't. I don't know why God. Um, I mean, clearly, God knows what's going to go on, right? He knows that these folks are probably they're going to have this choice to follow him or not follow him. And yet maybe that's the most amazing thing about God is that even when he knows that they might not follow him, he still allows it to happen. Um, I heard one time someone say, uh, you know, because that's part of the question, right? Would God allow sin to happen? If God knew they were going to sin, why would he allow sin to happen? And, and someone once said, well, if there was no sin, there would be no forgiveness. And we know about God primarily through forgiveness and grace. Because that's the kind of God we have. So it's almost like sin, even though it's bad, it sort of brings us to a good end, which means that God knows we can understand God's grace and knowledge about that. And so so I wonder, maybe maybe he knew that this whole thing was going to go down, and he decided to do it anyway, because forgiveness is much stronger and grace is much stronger than anything else. <coughs> it's kind of along the same lines. Why does, it, why does the action of two people affect all of us? When I think about that, I think kind of what we were talking about. You know, when we go back to it, we're kind of all made up of the same stuff, and all of us are prone um, to wander or, or make bad choices or um, or sin. So I think <clears throat> I don't know if it's that the action of those two people affect all of us as much as you know. This is how we were created, and God found a way to make sure that that God can connect with all of us. I really like these questions. I mean, they're hard, but they're good. Um, this is the, why do bad things happen to good people? And then another one along the same lines. Why does God allow disease and suffering to innocent children like sex abuse, starvation, and events like um, New, Newtown, 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 Connecticut, Newtown, Connecticut Elementary Newtown. School? <laughs> Go for it. Um, I don't know that, um, I don't know that, it's really, the allows cause thing is really hard for me. It's a place I struggle in my faith. And I don't know, um, I think that those things are the product of people making really awful bad choices and that God is present in that suffering, but I don't think um, God causes it. And I don't even know, I mean, this is where for me, there's this really, there's this struggle between God being sovereign and all powerful and all knowing but not being the kind of God that just like does this and moves people and makes people do things or not do things. So I think with that, with those choices, come these real consequences that we have to endure um, until Christ returns and, and that stuff is no more. And I think that's why scripture, I think that's why Jesus talks so much about justice because God's design and God's plan is for people 
like us, people who are Christians, to make sure that we are seeking justice and we, that we are um, calling people to justice and that we're telling people about, you know, Jesus and who Jesus Christ is. So that would be my... Yeah. Is question on yeah. that? Is it, is it because maybe he's trying to get our attention? I don't know if I... Maybe I don't know if I like that. That's probably not a good theological answer. But I'm, I just wonder not if, the no, for, example, <laughs> for example, I'm not sure if God's trying to get my attention so that God's going to do something to my kid. I was just having this conversation with someone last week. Their children have special needs, and they just got more bad news. And so the natural question is, did I do some, is God trying yeah. to get my, am I doing something wrong? Right. And I just don't think, I go back to the, the parable of Jesus and this blind son. Because the disciples come to him and go, you know, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Like, it could be his fault or it could be his parents' fault, right? And God says, no, or Jesus says, no, no, no. No one sinned to make this happen, but God is going to be revealed in all of this. Don't you worry. And so, I just don't think that, I personally, I think God can get our attention through stuff like this, but I'm not sure if God, this is me, oh. causes my child to suffer, for example, so that I can... I think that the reality is we live in a broken world right. where stuff happens yeah. and people aren't nice to each other and people sin. And my sin doesn't just affect me, but my sin affects other people. And sometimes I can even take my sin on the road and all of a sudden I leave this broad swath of crap, you know, that doesn't just affect me, but it affects other people. And so it can happen. I mean, it can affect others. But then the good news is that even for them, God can say, I can, I can even use this for good, for good measure. How God does that sometimes, I don't know. But I have to trust in that and kind of walk into that and say, okay, God, you're stronger than this. Right. Question. These are um, all um, senior pastor questions. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you believe how God created the world over what science says? I would keep going. And just keep, there's a, they're all in that same genre. Did Adam and Eve just appear older, or did they grow up first? Good question. Why was the time frame in which... What was the time frame in which the world was made? Actually, one week or years. How was God created? How was God created, or was he just always there? And in what language was God speaking when he created the earth? Because, for example, when God called the space sky, was it English, or was he speaking some fancy God language? Um, <laughs> why did he create species that is so much more dominant than everything? So I think, actually, this is a good question just about scripture itself. Like, I think what we want to do... <clears throat> I think oftentimes there's this dichotomy set up between scripture, Christianity, and science, right? Like you have to believe in one or the other. And I just don't believe that's true at all. I believe, I don't believe, um, I believe that Genesis, it isn't really supposed to be a science book. And what I mean by that is, I, I think there's good scientific, like if you look through the days of creation, just the way it went, right? Earth, sky, water, stuff came out of the water, there was stuff on land. I'm not saying it exactly right. But that pretty much follows the scientific understanding of evolution in our day, right? So I, I, for me personally, I don't have any problem totally syncing up science and the creation story of Genesis. In fact, I feel like one is trying to tell a, science is trying to tell how did this happen, and, cre and the creation story of Genesis is telling why did it happen, right? They're just asking different questions. You wouldn't read a, you wouldn't read a fairy tale like it was a history book. Right, you read it like a fairy tale, and I'm not saying the Bible is a fairy tale, I'm just using that as an example. You read it like a fairy tale. You read a science book like a science book, you read a history book like a history book. And this part of scripture is not a science book. It's supposed to be a theological story of why and how did we get to where we're at, and what does it say about God. So for me personally, I can look at science and go, man, this is awesome, look at what God did. And it has not, it has, I don't see anywhere where it um, doesn't connect up with scripture. That goes to questions like, was the earth built in seven days. You didn't say built. You said made. Um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think, I think some people believe that and that's just great. <clears throat> I just don't think that, that you have to believe that to be a Christian. Like I, I'm fine thinking it took millions and billions of years to create, because really this isn't a book about science, right? Seven days is the perfect number. It's a, it's a number in scripture that, that we refer to a lot of God's number. And so there's this balance, there's this order. And so I personally have, don't have any problem reconciling those two and feeling like I can be faithful to scripture and faithful to, science, to what science teaches us. Um, 
Um, did Adam and Eve just appear older, or or did they grow up? Man, I got no clue. Um, that's a great. But apparently they died, right? So we do know they did get older at some point. <clears throat> and um, let's think here. Is there anything? All of them? Yeah, keep going. Okay. Oh wait, a second. and what language was God speaking? <clears throat> I have no idea. But you know, the cool part is in in John in the New Testament, right? The very first words of the Gospel of John. It says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word that it's talking about there is Jesus, right? He's the living Word of God. And so it says God spoke for himself in history. God spoke the world into existence, and then God spoke himself into history in Jesus Christ, and, and he's the living Word. And so I have no idea. Probably Hebrew. No, I have no idea. Maybe some good God language. There's a verse in the Bible, and it says that God has a plan for you for good and not evil, but there's been some pretty stuff, tough stuff in my life. How can bad things in life be part of God's plan for good? So <clears throat> I, I love this question. When I read it, I was thinking about how I decided um, probably some years ago, I don't know how many, but not that long ago actually, that when I think about my own life and who God is and what God's doing with me, that I have to... Um, spend more time thinking um, in retrospect than I do in present because I'm not, I'm just not good at judging what's good and what's not good in the midst of something. Like, I, I just have a really hard time. We all have a really hard time, I think, seeing things clearly in the moment. But as I look back, how many of you can look back on something that was hard in your life and see, oh, I could see God doing that, that, and that? Any of you? Can you have that? But in the moment, did you really know that? No, it's just too hard. It's too hard for us to know and understand. So, I think this question a little bit gets at um, how much we trust God and um, and really lean into God during difficult times and ask for those things. Ask for clarity. Ask for God to be present. Ask for eyes to see in the midst of something so that we we can know and understand what's really happening. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Um, why was I made to be exactly who I am? And why did God make me and not anyone else? Me, capital. I don't know what that means. Yeah. That, <clears throat> that probably comes out of two weeks ago. <clears throat> I was talking about how you're placed in this time period, you know, made who you are, where you are, the way God made you, because God's got a plan that only He can fulfill, that only you can fulfill through, you know, okay. only He can do through you. So got it. that's probably where that's it. coming from. Man, I, that question is so good because I think that's the beauty of the gospel. Right? That's the beauty of our understanding of who God is, that God created us just as I am. He didn't create me as I should be. He created me just as I am, right? And and because of that, he has a plan and a purpose for me. And that's really the story of Scripture, and that's the story of God in our lives, that God always has his plan. He created me just as I am and calls me to be more like him. And why did he create me and not make anybody else? Because he just loves you and cares for you and thinks that you're the best thing ever. And he needs you around. And so um, uh, I, I, think, uh, I think that's, the com that's just the, the easy answer to that question. I think just because he absolutely needed to. Because he wants you. Because he just wants to. Because he loves you. No other good reason. Yeah. Okay, uh, um, I have a question. That's a little bit oh, of a mind. Time, right? yeah. oh. It's a little bit of a mind blower, huh? <laughs> yeah, and you know, I think like the Psalms. Some of the Psalms where it talks about God and how, you know, I look up at the heavens and those are the work of your fingers, and I say I can't even comprehend you. You're just like like I'm just touching the surface, and you know, in the New Testament it talks about now we're just seeing in a little bit of a mirror, but then we're going to see face to face. In other words, everything we know about God is just so small and tiny. And someday when Jesus comes back, we're going to know so much more. And so your question, kind of that pulse of how can God do this and how can God know all these things and be with all of us at once and yet be one God, I think that's just part of the mind-blowing, <coughs> incredible creativity and, and awesome power of, of who God is. And I can't explain it. Yeah, I think that it's <coughs> like it's our limited it's our limited knowledge, our limited um, experience of things that we can't actually picture what it is because I think it's beyond 
what we can, we, what we actually could comprehend. And I think Scripture talks about that as it, um, as it moves on and and goes, you know, goes through. One of the two of the verses that I was I thought of uh, around these questions and around that are the it's on Psalm one thirty nine. I think that's a really important psalm for all of us to know. It's about you know, it's God. I've searched you and I know you. Um, and it talks about your thoughts are too vast for me. I can't even, I can't even count all of them. And then the other uh, verse is the, um, I know I came so that you might have life and have it, ab- have, have it abundantly. And the translation of that is that you might have life and have it to the full, you know, so that you might have this full, amazing life. And I think you have to remember that's how God feels about you, which I think is hard to remember. It's a good. What led you to God? How did this change your thought on who he is? It's a good question. Well, I, you know, I was born, I mean, I was I was born 42 years ago. I'm just kidding. Um, I was born uh, into a Christian home, and so, you know, I have a mom and a dad who believe in Jesus, and, like, my very first memories are reading scripture stories with them and being told that I'm loved because God loves me and about you who Jesus is. But then it wasn't just my little family, it was really my church family. Like, they just loved me and cared for me. My youth group, my kids growing up, you know, kids with me growing up. And then the other part in the church, so as far as who led me to God, those are the people that led me to God. But I really believe that it's the opposite. It's almost like God, um, it's not that God led me to him, but it's almost like God came towards me. Because that's what really what God does. God, you know, sometimes we think, oh my gosh, God is way over there, and I've just got to do all this stuff so I can get to God, you know, and if I could just do a little bit more, I can get to God. And I just think that's the exact opposite of the way God really works. Actually, you're standing here, and what we believe is that God has come to us, and God has come to you, and just surrounds you and loves you. That doesn't mean that we have things to do, to pursue Him and be in relationship with Him, but it means that He's the one that first comes to us. So when I think about this question, what led you to God, I really think it's God led me to Him. You know, God, God is the one who did all this. And... Um, that being said, this second part of this question, how did it change your thoughts? I think for probably the first 18 years of my life, I really believed that it was my job to stay close to Like, it was my job to do enough good stuff to make sure that God liked me. I think I would say that. I knew that God loved me, right? Because God's got to love me because God is love. But to have God love me or like me, I wanted to kind of be that goody person that did all the right stuff so that God would love me and everybody would love me. And what I, I came to um, understand is that, wait a second, there's not enough good in my life that I could possibly make God love me. <laughs> that God just loves me and even likes me. And that's a big, that was a big change for me, that God doesn't just love me, that God might like me. Like, he really would like, like to hang around with me. Um, not just because he's got to, but because he created me and he just thinks I'm neat. Um, and so, but that didn't happen until I was probably 18 or 19. So, And then it just still keeps changing and, and going. I feel like God is always, my understanding of him, I um I came to I became a Christian when I was in high school, so I did not grow up in the church, and um, so it was the '90s, and I had really big hair, and I was wearing a tracksuit when I met Jesus. Tell about your pocket. <laughs> I also had I had a lowered yes I did have a lowered vehicle with really big rims on it and everything and dark tinted windows and a good sound system and a, and um, yes yeah, some subwoofers or something and the trunk. I mean, it was serious. The louvers would vibrate. <laughs> Come on, you guys. This is amazing. <laughs> I was in, it was Vegas. It was awesome. And um, and I I started going, I went to summer camp. So I sort of had a summer camp experience. You guys went to summer camp or a camp or a mission trip or something like that. Sort of, I think, God took me out of, uh, of my normal context. And as I began to learn about God's love and, and faithfulness, I it was the good news that I needed to hear. Um, and it changed my life, it changed, my brother and I came to faith, and then um, my my parents um, didn't, they went to church a little bit, like Christmas and Easter, we called ourselves Keister Christ, um, Christmas, <laughs> Christers. And, um, and then they, my mom and my dad, my mom started to go, my dad didn't, but my mom started to go to church from that experience, <laughs> and um, it just continued on from there, so, and I totally agree with what you said about, I think that reminder that God is coming to us, he's seeking you, he's trying to find you and to be watching for that so much of I think our life um, we miss in the in during our normal days because we're just focused on one thing Um, so I 
think when we really open our eyes, we can see God all over the place. That's why mission trips or youth trips or any of those experiences are so serious and good in our lives because what really what we're doing is we're just paying attention. I think if we paid attention like that all day long, we would have a lot more of those experiences just in our normal life. But we would have to be open to change, open to not just living by our own pressure, our own perspective. You know, it's a lot of work to get there. Um, so, yeah. Any other questions, thoughts? Yes, Josh? Well, I guess while we're on this week, um, I would love it if, uh, so if we guys just talk, touched on a little bit, like we talked about like there's God and made everything good. Talking about us and our total depravity and you know how we make bad choices, but there's there's a third party at play um, that you know you know Satan and uh, you know dark forces like that in our lives that we have to deal with um, who are inspiring evil and making things like that happen. So how does that fit into the picture? That's good. Yeah, so I think that's a good reality. Something we have to watch for too is that. You know, we believe in our Christian faith that there is evil, you know, there's darkness in the world. That it's not just, you know, everything's wonderful and I, as long as I keep myself clean, I won't have any. There's actually this, this force out there called evil, right? That, that there's evil broken into the world that um, is trying to bring us down. But the good news of the gospel is that good triumphs over evil. You know, light triumphs over darkness. The darkness overcomes us, but the darkness, I'm sorry, the darkness is here, but the darkness will not overcome because light triumphs over darkness. And so that's the other thing. I mean, I think we have to be aware of that, that there's, there are forces that are trying to get us. That being said, you know, one of my fears is sometimes I think we can give too much power to the devil, right? We can say, oh my gosh, the devil has so much power. It's like, no, 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 wait a second. God has more power than the devil. And so that's really good to know that, that I've got to make sure and keep that in in, a, in play, and yet it's good to remind ourselves that we have, you know, we have uh, someone in, in evil that, that's that's going to try to take us the wrong way, and so we've got to be aware of that. Which is why you have a group like this, which is why you have we have our church, which is why we stay in scripture, which is why we pray, is to try to, to keep those voices louder than the other voices. Um, I think what I try to do, and I try to remember, is to know myself. So I'm I'm super intuitive. And I, I believe in spiritual warfare. I believe that there is good and there is evil. And there are times in my life where I can almost feel like, you know, have you ever walked into a place where you've just felt like, ooh, this is icky. There's something going on here. I really trust the Holy Spirit in that. So I talk, I call on the Holy Spirit. I call on Jesus' name all the time. I, when I feel, when I get any sense that mm, something icky is going on here, something that this does not feel like Jesus to me, I... Um, I do what scripture tells us to do, which is call on the name of Jesus, pray, speak against any evil, you know, um, and and make sure that I'm also in, in my own way, making sure that I know myself and that I'm acting in what God is asking me to do, that I'm looking at myself and I'm looking, you know, at the situation and trying to figure out, um, you know, what's true and what's real and what is about God in that situation. But I think it's something we don't talk about as much. You know, that we can call on God's name when we feel evil or things going on. And um, and that we can seek out each other to say, hey, does this seem right to you? You know, that kind of stuff. I think it's really important. I'm sorry, I have to go. Another <laughs> meeting. That's this okay. Thank so you so fun. much. Yes, thanks for letting me be here. I'm praying for you guys. You guys are scripture, reading scripture, and knowing scripture really helps with this, right? Because it's the way that we know, the only way for us, this is what God has given to us to know about him. And so it's the way that we have a lens to see the world and to see our lives through is God's word. So looking in God's word for things. I also think I am really big on, as I read about Jesus, 
I my my favorite thing about Jesus is every time it seems like someone knows the answer, it's Jesus is like, no, <laughs> that's not it. And I try to remember that all the time. And my judgment of other people and my assumptions of other people and my look at evil, I'm just always trying to remember that it's usually just when I think, like, I know what that means. I totally get that, that God is, teaches me something else that sort of flips it, flips it on its head. Um, because that's part of my own journey is learning and growing and trying to understand it. So I really, I look to Jesus, look to Jesus, look to Jesus, look to Jesus. Yes? Do you have an analogy, a simple one that would help um, the kids here understand what the Holy Spirit really kind of, can grasp what that really is. I mean, that's a, that was a hard concept for me mm. <clears throat> at 14. It still was at 50. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, you know, just that that's the gift that we're giving, yeah. given uh, in our faith. And because you've mentioned it a couple times, and yeah, something that is really. So when I think about the Trinity, <laughs> uh, and, and I don't know if you guys have talked about the Trinity. Yet. Have you talked about the Trinity? Okay. When I think about the Trinity, God, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I um, I always think of. Um, water, ice, and steam. So same, same, made up of the same things, but three different forms, right? And I think one place we misunderstand the Holy Spirit, so there's God who created the earth, God sent his son Jesus Christ to redeem us of our sin, and then Jesus left his spirit with us. And one way I think that we misunderstand the Holy Spirit is we think the Holy Spirit is acting out here, like it's just Holy Spirit is just moving around and we're just interacting with the Holy Spirit. But we forget that God is actually a part of us, that the Holy Spirit is also within. So it's within each of us. So I think that is a really good reminder for us about our own identity and what God's doing in us and through us. Really, the Holy Spirit is what God left for us to be able to tap in and understand who Jesus Christ is in our life and how God feels about us. So if any of you, um, I would call them mountain experiences, have any of you ever had an experience where you're at camp or something, um, you're at, on a mission trip or you're even with your friends or you're in the box or you're doing something and you have that feeling of like, there's some, something happening that's bigger than you and you feel a part of it and it all kind of makes sense. You ever had that feeling? Raise your hand if you've had that feeling. That is the Holy Spirit. That to me is a moment of the Holy Spirit and I call it a flicker. So I, w I don't live in flickers. Like, I don't live all the time feeling like, oh, I have the Holy Spirit. Everything's great. It's so amazing. Oh. But I live for flickers because those are those moments where I feel like, oh, my gosh, it makes sense, and I can, I'm okay, and I can live into it a little bit. So that's how, how I think of the Holy Spirit. Um, I don't know if that was helpful. Yeah. Is that helpful? Yeah. I've never heard that one. Which one was which? The Holy Spirit steam. Just going yeah. everywhere. Yeah. yeah. It's all over, uncontrollable. Yeah, that's how I, I think God is um, water, and Jesus is ice, the rock, and the spirit is steam. But I'm making that up right now. I always felt the like spirit steam. I guess God could be the rock too, the ice too. But I think God's water. Jesus is water. You think? I thought Jesus was wine. Well, I, I, I didn't think Jesus was wine. Jesus turned water into wine. Maybe that does make sense. He's the water. Can, okay. Yeah, but I can see also Jesus as ice because it's something, he was like physical, right? Like yes, was, like, yes, that's solid, good. Like, solid, yeah. physical. We can yeah. push up against Jesus. Yeah. That's totally true. <laughs> that's a great question. I know, yeah, that's totally true. Any other questions, thoughts, insights? Here's the only other thing I would say. I felt really fortunate when I came to faith that I came to faith with around people who really allowed me to question and who told me that I would always question. Like I, I think, you know, we, we think there's going to be a simplistic answer, especially when we're talking about this stuff like sin and suffering, that there's going to be this simple answer. And I think as you go through your, your journey of faith, as you go to different churches, as, I, would, I would be leery of simple answers because I don't think life is simple. I don't think faith is simple. I think... Um, God is always working and always acting, always bigger than us. And I encourage you to read scripture your whole life because otherwise you are at the mercy of the interpretation of other people about what the gospel means. But if you know and you read scripture, then you can enter that conversation. And that's the Holy Spirit will work through you as well um, to be able to know and understand what, what God's word is talking about. So read your Bible. Get a study Bible if you don't have one. I can help you find one that's not as boring. We have some.
That's good. Because otherwise when you read it, it can be really confusing, but it doesn't have to be. Questions, insights, comments, concerns, last words? Right here. Right here. Yes. I have a question. Like, back to, like, the creation, do you think God did these, like, the big bang, like, evolution, or, like, make people, or do you think God just created, like, the universe, like, just by fluke? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So, I went to Whitworth University, and um, at, at Whitworth was this guy named Steve Meyer, and he now works at the Discovery Institute in Seattle, and he has done his life work on on creation versus evolution and how uh, how the world came to be. So I, I believe that in scripture, like Jeff said when he was talking about, you know, that this is the story of how God created the earth. I don't I don't know that it's to be taken literally every little part, like how long was a day then? You know, I have a lot of questions about that. But I do not believe that the world could have been created without something outside causing it to, causing humanity to be created. So when I look at the Big Bang Theory, what, where it falls short for me is that I don't, I, I can't imagine the probability of all those things coming to work together without something outside causing humanity to be formed. We're just too intricate for me to believe that. So that's my personal you know, thought or feeling about it. Other Christians would take what God says literally. Um, but I, the Discovery Institute is a great, and actually I was just talking to someone last week about maybe having Steve Meyer come, because he just does an amazing job of talking about this exact thing that, that we struggle with. But I think, like Jeff, I think faith and science go together. I don't, I think we've sort of tried to separate it, and it's not, it's not to be separated. I think, um, I think faith and science is connected. Does that answer Last chance to ask me any question you want. <laughs> Not really. You could always just, I don't know, ask me, Patrick. <laughs> or call me, maybe. I'm <laughs> 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 just glad you guys are awake. You're doing a great job. It's super warm in here and cozy. I don't know how you're awake. <laughs> so, uh, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got a couple then, things when you're done. Uh, oh, but Josh has some When you're done, here we go. When I'm done. Okay, so let's just pray and then. Josh has some Let's pray. Bring it back, yes. Yeah, let's, let's, let's bring it back. Let's pray. Let's pray. <laughs> awesome. I, I, I like this. God, thanks for these students. Um, thanks that they remember mid high in the clap. Um, thanks for Becky and Jeff and their insights and. Just for this time and permission to ask questions and try to figure it out, God, because we um, we just wrestle with all of these things, and we know that sin and suffering is such a hard topic to talk about, and sometimes it's really real and raw for us. So, God, please be with us in our conversations um, this week as we as mentors meet with our students, and um, as we all talk amongst each other, God, that you would be at work, that you would be in those conversations, and that you would be giving us um, hope and clarity. In Jesus' name, amen.